We have one more board member that is in route. She'll be here in just a couple seconds. So we do need to wait for her. We had a few board members that uh, thought this was um, also a Zoomy, which it's not. So we are uh, going to follow the process that we did up front that it's an in-person meeting. So. Yeah. Oh, okay, now we have two more. Great, good afternoon. With the quorum present, the Maricopa Regional Continuing Care Board meeting is now called to order. Please turn on your microphones when speaking. The MAG public comment process allows members of the public to comment on items on today's agenda or on items that fall under the COC's jurisdiction. If you would like to comment at today's meeting, please fill out a white request to speak card located at the information table and give it to a MAG staff. And if you parked in the garage, parking validators are available on the information table. If you purchase a transit ticket to come to the meeting, please see a staff for ticket. Hearing assistive devices are available from MAG staff. Um, I would like to remind the board uh, that this is an in-person meeting um, and the meeting invitations that we have been given by MAG does not include drive time. So if we could go ahead and make sure we uh, incorporate that. Uh, for the four meetings that we are gonna have in person February, May, August, and November, um, we will not be having a Zoom. So it's gonna be critical that we have a quorum in order to uh, be able to move forward. I will also ask Katie to have the same information in the email since those that are probably impacted by that are not hearing this uh, update. So we'll make sure that we pass it along. Um, Katie, please take a roll call. Members of the board, please say that you are here and your organization after Katie calls your name. Fish Brown Gambino. Jacqueline Campbell. Here, U.S. Fitz. Thank you. Tad Gary. Lisa Glow. Chris Hallett. Here, City of Peoria. Thank you. Michael Hughes. <clears throat> Natalie Lewis. Here, City of Mesa. Thank you. Rachel Milney. Sean Pierce. Here, Maricopa County. Thank you. Charles Sullivan. Danielle Wright. Here, Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. Thank you. Co-Chair Vicki Phillips. Here, CBI. Thank you, Co-Chair Rob Potlogger. Here, Valley of the Sun United Way. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a call to the audience. This is the opportunity for the public to comment on items that fall under the Continuum of Care Board that are not on the agenda or that are on the agenda for discussion and not for action. 15 minutes will be provided for the call to the audience agenda item unless the committee requests an exception to this limit. Katie, were there any comments received uh, or anyone who wishes to offer comments at this time? Co-Chair Podblogger, no comments were received and I don't believe we've received any comments from the audience. Great, thank you. We'll move on to the next agenda item. Let me see here. Our next agenda item is the approval of the consent agenda. Items 3A and 3B are on the agenda for consent. Item 3B had a few revisions after the ESG committee and were attached to the calendar invite as well as posted online. These changes, including adding VAWA to the HMI section, efforts by jurisdictions to include individuals experiencing homelessness and the inclusion of carbon monoxide detectors in locations were applicable. Does any member of the board have questions, comments, or request a presentation of any of these items? Great, with no comments, could I have a motion to approve the consent items 3A and 3B? This is Chris, I move. Chris, first, can I have a second? This is Danielle, Vicki. Danielle, a second. Danielle, second? Great, thank you. Is there a discussion of the motion? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. The motion passes and we'll move on to the next agenda item.
Great. So we're going to be moving um, item five out of order because uh, we have a speaker that we want to be able to uh, go ahead and go next. Amy St. Peter's, St. Peter, the Deputy Executive Director and Kelly Taft, Communications Director for MAG, will provide an overview of the regional affordable housing efforts. Let's take it away. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Madam Co-Chair and members of the, of the board. I'm really excited to be in front of you today. We've been working for a long time on this campaign and we've been gathering feedback from you throughout the process. So we want to be able to circle back with you to let you know where we've landed in terms of the campaign and to get your ongoing um, feedback, support, and hopefully partnership because we're getting ready to launch a campaign here very, very soon. And we hope that you'll join us in promoting that campaign far and wide. And I do apologize in advance. I'm going to have to leave probably before this presentation is done because I have to get to another meeting. I leave you in very good hands with Kelly Taft, MAG's communication director, who's been really helping to, to lead this project as well. Can you have the next slide, please? So just a little bit about the partnership as well as about the campaign itself. So um, Pathway to Home, which was approved back in December of 2021, and you as a board took action on that. So thank you for your support in the development as well as with the approval of that, uh, of that plan. It included the development of a public education campaign around affordable housing, very specifically to increase acceptance of affordable housing. Because we know that as we're addressing homelessness, we need a place for people to go. And very often that answer is affordable rents and mortgages. Without it, we often see increased numbers of people experiencing homelessness, similar to what we've been seeing throughout the region um, and really throughout the country over the past year or two in, uh, in, in particular. So we started developing that campaign and in April of um, 2021, we were um, asked to please merge our efforts with Home Matters to Arizona. Home Matters has been convening a group um, around the same idea. How do we increase acceptance of affordable housing? So it doesn't really make sense to have competing or conflicting campaigns. We very much wanted to be able to work together. So we've been working um, very collaboratively in this space with a broad range of, of stakeholders. We've touched more than 1,500 people so far just in the development of this campaign, really to get your feedback, to get your feedback from people who are working in the field um, in, and in various fields, to be able to help us really develop a campaign that will resonate across a very diverse group of people and that's the population of our region. We have some areas that are very urban, some very rural, more affluent, more challenged in terms of um, their socioeconomic status. And this campaign really needs to resonate with everybody because we need everybody increasing acceptance of affordable housing throughout the region. So today then we'll be, I'm talking very specifically around the name of the campaign as well as the visual identity. These are really important components of the campaign and maybe what we think of first when we think about, well, what does a campaign include? But really it includes all of these other things. It's the messaging, it's the purpose, it's the mission. It's really focusing in on community. So we've been addressing all of these other elements of the campaign, but during our time with you today, we'll be um, really focusing in on the visual identity and the name. Next slide, please. It's important as we do that to level set. Why are we doing this campaign and what are we hoping to achieve? And the why is really creating a safe place for everybody to be at home. And it's um, not about any one particular model or type of housing. It's not exactly where it's located. It's, it's that everyone ha has access to that. And that we as a community, as a region, thrive when everyone has a place to be at home. And so what we're trying to accomplish with the campaign is that we're trying to cultivate champions in every community, in every part of the region, to be champions of affordable housing. And it's not just um, affordable housing as a particular type. It's a whole idea that everyone needs a safe home. And in doing so, we can thrive. We can prosper more when, um, when every person has that. And we'll, um, and we'll have fewer people experiencing homelessness because they have a home that meets their needs. And in terms of meeting their needs, that's financially. It's their level of ability. It's proximity to jobs and to school and to medical care. So we're defining that pretty broadly. Next slide, please. And so in the campaign, you know, there's any different number of really valid ways to approach this issue. And in all of them, there's absolutely the sense of urgency. But you can communicate a sense of urgency with, you know, hair on fire, bring the alarm bells, we're in crisis, and in some ways that's very true. It can also be kind of intimidating for folks though. So instead, we wanted to keep that sense of urgency, but we really wanted to convey the outcome if we're successful in this campaign. And so it's looking at how do we bring people together? It's really inclusive, it's approachable, it's personal, um, really clarifying um, kind of that sense of reassurance and, and joy that, you know, if everyone does have a home, we're all okay. Like no one loses when everyone has a home, right? And so it's really trying to convey a very positive image with this campaign. 
um, to cut through some of the noise and um, some of the other approaches to this campaign. And then we want people to think too, because feeling is what really drives people to action. But then we want to cultivate some pretty actionable thoughts as a result of this campaign. And so the idea is that it's for all of us. It's not just for some of us. We don't want to come across with, you know, kind of the finger out, the ruler out, you know, saying, shame on you. You didn't support this. Well, that's not going to lead anybody to a positive outcome, right? So we want this to be constructive. We really want to engage people in a deep sense and to be able to talk about and demonstrate and get an understanding of that shared benefit when everyone has access to affordable rents and mortgages. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so the name, we spent a lot of time, a lot of very intentional thought about what do we call this? Understanding that people are coming to this conversation from very different places. And can we develop a name that's really inclusive and will resonate with that very diverse group of people? And so this is the process that we've gone through. We've analyzed names that are already being used. One, to make sure that we don't use them. <laughs> and then two, to make sure that we've learned from how others have named their campaign so we can look to their successes. Also looked at, um, I think, an initial list of 64 different names. By the way, we landed on a name that was not on that initial list for reasons that I'll get into, um, but really casting the net very broadly. So what names could work with this campaign that really evoke those feelings and stimulate those thoughts that, that we just covered? And then adopting that new name. And the legal review there is really critical because with this campaign, we're going to be sharing this with all of you, with many people throughout the region and asking you, please promote this campaign. Please use these campaign materials. Please use these social media posts. We don't want to give you anything where there is even a hint of, well, maybe somebody else already has this. And will somebody else call me out and you know, send me a fine or a fee because I've used this and I didn't know that it actually belonged to somebody else. So we've had a much higher level of legal scrutiny on this because we are asking you to share it. Next slide, please. And because of that, none of those names worked. <laughs> They're great names, love the names. We have public input sessions. Unfortunately, none of them passed that higher legal review. Next slide, please. So, but we wanted to keep all of your input and we wanted to honor your input. And so we took all of um, the, the thoughts that you had shared around those names and said, okay, if we're going to find a new name, we want it to still abide by and honor the input that's been previously given. Next slide, please. So this is our name. Home is where it all starts. The reason why this passed legal review is because it was trademarked back in 2014 by Home Matters Arizona. So one of our partners, um, they, they've had this trademark for a long time, but they've not really fully utilized this name. And so they are letting us use it, which is fantastic. And so home is where it all starts. And you can fill in that sentence. So like home is where, home is where I find love. Home is where I feel safe. Home is where I can thrive and prosper. So you can fill that in with any number of different um, answers, but it all starts with home. So again, it's that positive, very constructive approach. Next slide, please. And right, and so these are some just additional thoughts with it. Um, it can convey different meanings, and but they're positive, right? And so we really want to be able to invoke that whole diverse breadth of what this name can give to us. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of how we might use this in the campaign. When we have the toolkits developed um, that we'll be sharing with you, um, we'll have all different manner of different messaging around this name using it. So you can really take a look at it and decide what will resonate best, best with your particular circle of influence and then use that accordingly. Next slide, please. At this point, um, I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Taft. And I apologize, I will need to step out. Um, but you're in very good hands with Kelly. She's been uh, really at the leading edge of all of this development. And if you'd like to speak with me personally after this, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to continue. I'd love to be able to continue this dialogue with you. Again, thank you so much. All of you were such an important part of developing this campaign. And we hope to be able to continue as we, we hope to continue partnering with you then as we launch this campaign next month. Great. Kelly? Thanks, Amy. So now we get to the second exciting part of the campaign, and that's the visual identity, which includes the logo, the fonts, the color palette, and the other visual elements. So this is just a reminder, I'm not going to read through this slide, but of the advice that Havelina gave when we presented naming options that are also true for the visual identity. Um, what our target audiences know and believe about this campaign will be created not just through the name and the logo, but for all of the campaign's actions and messages. So as you're processing this slide, um, just want to go over a few of the things that the core working group had in mind when they were developing the identity. They wanted a, a logo that demonstrated depth and nuance and was reflective of the campaign messaging. And because of this, it was decided early on that they didn't want any kind of an abstract logo. 
They also wanted to ensure that the logo conveyed positivity without being overly optimistic because it is a serious topic and we wanted to also reflect that seriousness. It was also important that it include elements of the home where we all live, which is the state of Arizona. So we really wanted it to have just some, some regionally appropriate look and feel in terms of where we live in Arizona. You can change the slide. So here is the logo. It's, um, when you take a close look at this, I'll just tell you a little bit about the elements of the design. The icon on the left-hand side is intended to give the effect of peering through a keyhole. The keyhole motif has rich meaning. It's the entrance, it's the start, it unlocks a new beginning. And of course it relates to the concept of home and the literal physical structure of a house or an apartment. The icon is made up of mostly contoured and curved lines that we feel are very organic, more comfortable and approachable, um, as opposed to something that would have straight or sharp lines. The interior of the keyhole is meant to evoke a quintessential Arizona scene, highlighting our shared home. This reflects our key messaging point about being in this together, that we all have a stake in addressing housing affordability. The colors we feel are bright and joyful with the mostly warm palette that leans into the gold, orange, and brown tones. The sky has gradient shades of blue. The overall effect is one of, and it wasn't intentional, but we started recognizing that it kind of is reminiscent of a stained glass window, which we also felt evoked feelings of hope and wonder and brings us back to some special places in our lives. The word mark is a simple rounded sensory font, welcoming but not playful, again, in order to retain credibility and respect the weight of the issue. All words in the logo except home are intentionally using lowercase letters because we do know it's a little bit long for a title, but that will help increase the readability and accessibility. For anybody who's looking on a smaller screen, you can see it pretty well here. That last little mark is the registered trademark to ensure that we protect the trademark. It looks kind of like a period and we think that's okay but that was a, a way of getting the registered trademark in and protect our, our mark. <clears throat> you can change the slide. So again, here's a mark on its own. So you can just see the elements. We do imagine the mark may be used on its own in some materials. And you can change the slide. This is the color palette again, the very warm tones with the golds and browns. And then the gradient shades of blue, we really wanted to make sure that you have the same blue, it's the same blue, but just in different shades of the same color, just in a different gradient. So going from lighter to darker so that the spectrum can be used in different ways. Being able to have a spectrum of color helps us reflect the concept of movement and change that's central to our campaign goals and also provides flexibility for different agencies um, in how they use the, um, the logo and, and, and how it's displayed. You can change the slide. So this would just be what it would look like on a one color black ground if you needed a, a one color solid black ground, background. Um, it shows some of the various options available with the color palette. And then the elements of the logo are still very distinct and recognizable, even just in, in just pure white. You can change the slide. This shows the full color logo and how it might look on different colored backgrounds in the overall palette. This could, these could appear on collateral pieces. Um, so we just thought it might be helpful just to kind of see some of the different options and change the slide. And again, here you can see how blue tones can be used to provide visual interest and variety without being busy. It's still working off the same color palette. Uh, again, something that might appear on a website or a collateral piece. Here, I think you get the true sense of the depth, warmth, the movement that we're seeking to evoke from the brand. You can change the slide. And this is just an example of how it might look in the wild. So this is a hypothetical billboard that would show uh, how that mark would be used on the billboard. You can change the slide here, it's on a t-shirt. And then we can go to the next steps. So you can change to the next slide. So um, on Wednesday, members of our team are actually going to be doing sort of a soft launch of the campaign. They will introduce it during the Arizona Housing Co Coalition Conference. So we're going to take also, um, that's going to be a 70 minute session um, on Wednesday um, and Amy St. Peter and Ash us are going to be presenting and, and I think that Denise Resnick a little bit about the campaign. Then we're also going to be taking advantage of an art space opportunity that they have available at the, con uh, at the um, conference. So we're going to have an artist on hand who will sketch responses and interpret them when people ask, what does home mean to you? Um, both looking 
through the keyhole as if you were looking from the inside out into what does the community look like? And then also outside in, what does home look like? And then she will sketch those and create some JPEGs. So we should have some real fun social media um, art, art that we can share as kind of a fun, a fun thing. And then we're also really excited to be working through Cox Integrated Partnership. This was um, Valley Leadership that had brought them on board. They had the opportunity to, um, to work with Cox through an integrated partnership agreement. And so they're going to be helping us with the website production and media elements. And a lot of this is provided to us um, free of charge. Uh, but they will also um, help with some of the success stories that feature individuals who've experienced a positive housing transition. And then they will um, be able to um, help us with the actual media buying. So we are going to be continuing to fundraise to augment those media buys, but we really feel like that Cox um, partnership is, is getting us a lot of a really great benefit in terms of the things that they're able to provide for us. The toolkit, it's undergone some revisions, so it's almost ready to go. So we hope to be um, sharing that with you all very soon. And once we do, um, we do hope that you will get on the website. It's homeiswhereitallstarts.org. And um, it's available now. There's just a landing page. It should be, well, it should be live at least by Wednesday, I know for sure. And then you can put in your contact information so that we'll make sure that we're communicating with you once the elements of the campaign are ready to go like the toolkit. You can change the slide, I think that's it. So if you have any other questions or need to get a hold of us, that's my contact at the top and Amy's at the bottom. So uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm really happy to take any questions if you have them. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. Any comments or questions from the board? This is Vicki. I, I just want to comment on, I, I love the, the coloring, the intentional uh, concept behind the lettering and, and the keyhole. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. And I know there's been a ton of time and work and effort to get to this point. And I agree with Vicki, the colors, and I like the name and everything. The only question that I have is, um, you know, our primary focus and purpose was to help um, introduce and dispel misperceptions about homelessness and people experiencing homelessness. And I, I just feel my gut in this is that this is about affordable housing. And, and so I, I don't know, I just, that was just my initial gut. So I just wanted to put that out there and just see what you think, or if you guys had that conversation, or if you were purposeful about that too. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, point well taken, but I think where the core working group has landed is that one of the key goals of the campaign is to change the narrative around affordable housing. So when you get the toolkit, you'll see, unfortunately, affordable housing carries with it so much baggage so we're trying to find other ways to communicate that message, such as affordable rents and mortgages, and really focus on the way that the, the community can come together to reduce some of the um, nimbyism that exists, uh, to provide some cover for our elected officials who are at council meetings when the, these issues come before them and the board. And so it's really, I think the, the overarching goal of the campaign is to really change the narrative surrounding homelessness and affordable housing and to, to tamp down some of that opposition. So we do think that, um, you know, with the success stories that we focus on, I know the regional council really wanted to use real photos um, and show an accurate picture of homelessness in the region. So when, we, when you do see the um, website right now, it's populated with a lot of stock photos and we hope to change that very quickly. So we're, uh, we're working with a couple of companies, you know, a, a couple of organizations to try to get some of those real personal stories that are that are there. Um, if there are other, um, if there are other goals that you think are really important for the campaign, uh, please share them. We'd I'd love to hear them. I think that, you know, one of the benefits of this campaign is we're hoping that it, it includes flexibility so that whatever agency that you're with and whatever your specific goals are, that this campaign is flexible enough 
to still communicate under that umbrella and, and still adapt it to the needs of your individual organizations and nonprofits and, and what, what, whatever your, your main interest in. But if there's a different focus, please let us know and we'll see if we can add some of that messaging. Yeah, thank you. I just, I just think if you could give us some tools within this that is a lot more geared toward that issue of homelessness, I think that could be very helpful. Um, and maybe that would be enough. Yeah. Like, can I also add, um, Natalie, I think when the, this group originally started, there was both homelessness campaign and affordable housing campaign. And in looking at both directions, there was more uh, like emphasis around the affordable housing. And I don't think the homelessness campaign is off the table right now. Um, I think it is kind of a, a both and, not necessarily a this through that either. So um, I think there is still conversation about this and talking about how do we also dispel myths? How do we start to talk about homelessness in a different way? Um, and to Amy Schwab and Lenders credit in the audience, um, we had a long conversation last year when this started is like, if we're spending so much time talking about homelessness and not about home, where, where we rock off, I guess, of like, can we spend so much more talking about home since that is the solution? So I think we're still working on this and just figuring out what does that look like on a more robust level too. Uh, I kind of echo what Natalie's saying. I think if the toolbox can include application, I, I, I like the word of it all, but I think you have the whole housing continuum, right? Home is a whole continuum. And I think that's the important messaging. This and by itself will never go anywhere without an educational campaign to go with it to explain what part of the continuum are we talking about for home. And that's gonna be key, I think, in every application. So having a very extensive, robust toolbox or toolkit that we're gonna develop that covers the whole spectrum, including missing middle and everything, I think all of us are gonna be able to need to rely on that. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Really appreciate that. I know a lot of work and time goes into this and it sounds like this is gonna be something that can evolve over additional feedback. So appreciate your time today and thank you for the update. Thank you. And we'll make sure that we carry some of those uh, comments back to the board. And can I just ask one last question? I'm sorry. Of course. Um, what's the next step for this? Are we going to take it to the MAG Management Committee and then to the Regional Council? Is that where this is headed? Yes, we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be updating this presentation. Um, we are scheduled to go to the um, Human Services Technical Committee next, and then I believe Met Management Committee and then Regional Council, because um, they have not seen the final name and logo, so that will be a piece of it. But we also will be talking um, even in, in more in depth in terms of, of the next steps of the campaign. So we are hoping to get that toolkit done by the end of March. And so as we go into those meetings that we have, have that ready to go. And then again, we're starting to try to collect people's information so we can kind of start getting some of those um, champions who are inspired and cultivating those champions who can, can assist us. Could I also just make um, a suggestion that we take it to the local jurisdiction committee um, because I know you've spoken to all of us kind of individually, but this would be a good way to get that group and that good kind of conversation and make sure it's going to meet our needs to, to Chris's point. Um, and maybe even the people with lived experience committee as well, just making sure that our committees are really weighing in and feel like I, I want to I know that they feel really comfortable and confident because this could be something and a brand that we have to live with for a very long time. And, and we want that. We want that. So we, we just really need to make sure we've got that buy-in. And Mr. Chair, members of the board, I think that Amy's scheduled to do the local jurisdiction committee coming up right here. Great, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next agenda item. So the next agenda item will be updates. In an effort to have updates uh, go out to as many people as possible during board meetings, updates will be included in the newsletter as well as there is a newsletter archive page available on the MAG website under the resources and training section. During the, during the legislative session, we'll continue to hear updates on legislative activity. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dylan Belmont with MAG to provide an overview of the legislative activity. Dylan, you're up. Thank you, co-chair. Um, as we all know that the Arizona Housing Coalition Conference is happening tomorrow and Wednesday. So in lieu of Joanna Carr, I'm gonna be providing a brief 
uh, impromptu update. Um, there are like, of course, a, a ton of bills related to housing and homelessness at the legislature this year. Um, but today I'm just gonna focus on the uh, Housing Coalition's outlined priorities. Um, in general, there have been uh, a lot of developments recently um, because crossover week just occurred. Um, so there were like a few housing related bills that didn't um, receive a hearing in their original chamber before passing over. Um, so the first of these is, is related to the housing trust fund. Uh, the main bill that was being watched SB 1465 um, it was going to identify a few other alternative sources for, for regular deposits into the housing trust fund, but it did not um, receive a hearing, um, so it's effectively um, dead. However, um, there is a bill that did pass through um, its Senate committee, SB 1541, um, that does annually deposit 55% um, of unclaimed property sale monies into the housing trust fund. So next step on that, um, it's just awaiting a full vote by, by the Senate, um, but it did receive bipartisan support uh, when it was heard in committee. Um, so more info to come. Um, and then even beyond that, um, there is still talk of a one-time deposit into the housing trust fund um, that'll likely be part of budget negotiations um, in the coming weeks. Um, the next priority area uh, for the housing coalition was the teacher's bill, um, the one that would make employee housing available um, to school districts outside of those rural areas. Um, kind of a similar situation to that first housing trust fund bill. Um, it was never put on an agenda in the Senate. Um, however, there is still talk of um, like between stakeholders of finding another way to get that through, uh, whether that's, um, you know, a strike everything amendment. Um, so, you know, I would expect more discussion on that as well. Um, and then one more that kind of falls in that category, um, the bill uh, HB 2318 to expand uh, the state low-income housing tax credit. Uh, similar situation um, was not heard in its initial chamber, um, but yet again, there are still discussions on, you know, a strike everything amendment to see if it can get through. Um, I will say that uh, the governor, Governor Hobbs has, um, like very recently affirmed that she intends to make that tax credit permanent. Um, so, you know, future developments are, are pretty likely, um, whether it's through, um, you know, this legislative session or one to come. Um, last bit of news is the DES homelessness coordination line item bill, uh, SB 1462. That one did pass through um, all of its Senate committees, um, including appropriations. So um, that one too is just awaiting a full vote in the Senate. Um, and those are all of the priority bills. Of course, there's uh, dozens of other ones to go through, but um, just one other brief thing I wanna mention is that uh, the Housing Coalition did set their, their day at the Capitol um, for April 19th. So stay tuned for more information on that if you're interested in attending. Um, and then for, you know, for any other information on these bills or to have the opportunity to, to discuss. Um, we would also encourage uh, membership with the, the coalition to join their bi-weekly policy committee meetings. Um, and I think that's everything. Happy to take any questions if I'm able to answer them, I don't know. Are there any questions based on the conversation? Just, just a question, and I, I apologize if this shows that I'm um, not well informed, but um, do you guys go down and actually advocate for different bills or are you just there listening and recording and kind of watching how things go? Yeah, um, so MAG itself doesn't lobby for legislation. Um, the Housing Coalition is essentially um, the group that like tracks legislation and then they have like their own lobbyists, try advocates um, that speak on behalf of the bills. Okay, and then do they work with other groups like, you know, the Arizona League of Cities and Towns and all that? Okay, yeah, thank you very much and thank you for the update. Mm -hmm. Helen, can I just add to that? So the, the continuum of care as a body is not a body that can advocate, but do encourage every individual member as long as it is okay with your organization and you as an individual to act on any of the bills. And this is really just a, 
education piece, but I uh, really encourage you to advocate through those different avenues. Great, thank you. Dylan, thank you for pinching in on that. I see you're gonna be up for other conversations. So uh, perfect, let's move on. So Cleo Warner, Human Services Planner with MAG will provide an overview of the quarterly homeless trends report. Cleo. Yeah. All right, so uh, here on the screen, we have our most recent homelessness trends report. This is covering quarter four of 2022. Um, if you are unfamiliar with this report, all of the data is coming from our information system or HMIS, unless otherwise noted on the report. So that is where all this data is originating from. This first graph we see here is our households that are recently engaged with homeless service providers in Maricopa County. So this is our total active homeless numbers. The numbers you're seeing on the screen are the uh, household counts, individual counts are listed in the uh, narrative of the report. Um, as you can see, it has remained pretty steady with no significant jumps or dips, similar to last quarter. Moving down to our new two system, this is households that are experiencing homelessness for the first time. Um, following last quarter as well, we're seeing this sort of steady slight decrease um, in those numbers. Moving down to the last graph on the page, this is our positive exits. So um, this is anyone who has left the system um, and moved into permanent housing on their own. As you can see, we have a pretty significant jump um, since December. So that is some great news. Um, housing placements fall into this positive exit category. Um, those we do see a um, slight decrease in the beginning of the quarter and then an increase right at December at the end. Um, but I um, wanted to point out that this overall positive exits is quite nice. Moving further down to the second page, we have our um, demographics page. So this, um, as usual, is showing um, our heads of household, majority male as compared to female. Um, and then we, uh, moving down to race and ethnicity bars, and we, can we continue to see disproportionate numbers of those uh, representing uh, Black and Indigenous folks. And if you move down a little further on the page, uh, we get this um, comparison with census data. So it's a nice way to sort of show you and reference sort of what we have showing up in our system versus what um, census demographic breakdowns are. Um, yeah. And moving on down to the subpopulations page. So this basically, this page breaks down what we saw in that like active households, but by our subpopulation. So I'll point out a couple of these to you. Um, we'll start with families. We, do, we did see a slight decrease this quarter um, and it has decreased 16% since its peak in October, 2021. When we look at older adults, this is, no surprise um, if you've been following other quarters or um, our system flow dashboard updates, but we have seen an increase in 34% since December, 2021, an increase of 6% since last quarter. So um, this, is, this quarter is bringing us to the highest number of older adults um, in the system that we've seen. So a very um, dramatic increase compared to last year. And, as you can see that trend line, it is to climb. Youth decreased 5% since last quarter. Veterans, we have a slight decrease of 3% and our chronically homeless numbers remain fairly steady this quarter with a very minimal increase. The so last page on here is our system performance measures. So I'm gonna kind of walk us through the various squares uh, and give some context for the previous quarter. 
So first um, we have the reduction in length of time homeless. This um, is continuing the larger jump that we saw last quarter. This time it's just a smaller jump, but we're still seeing it um, continue to increase. Moving over to um, reduction in returns within one year. Uh, this is a slight increase since the last quarter. Moving down to increase in jobs and income growth. Um, we see this 1% change from last quarter. Uh, so that is a nice little positive trend in the right direction. Uh, same with reduction in first time homeless. Um, there was a jump up last quarter, so it's nice to see this reducing this quarter. And then we've got our um, increase to successful housing exits, permanent housing destinations, as well as the one next to it, um, permanent housing exits to sustaining housing, both have a um, slight decrease since last quarter. Then if we look uh, at the very bottom of the page here is um, what we're considering like a snapshot of the numbers um, by program type. So um, it shows a different way you can look at this where it um, changes over time. Um, we have on here comparisons to last quarter and last year. Keep in mind, this looks at a snapshot of one night. So um, it doesn't tell the entire picture, but is a different way of contextualizing data over time. And we had five new projects this quarter, three emergency shelters and two housing programs. And that was the review of quarter four for the homelessness trends report. Um, happy to take any questions you have. Sure. I, I, again, I, I feel like I'm the broken record about older adults entering homelessness, but when I'm looking at this report, I'm seeing that there's definitely the up uptick in older adults entering into homelessness who are not chronic because chronic is staying relatively flat and older adults are increasing month or quarter out over quarter. And so I'm really concerned that we are not set up for this and we're not setting ourselves up or our partners up for success. And so I think there needs to be more thought put into this because there aren't that many providers out there who are set up to doing this kind of outreach and this kind of service. So if we're seeing this, I mean, there are senior centers throughout the, the county. There are access points at various places. So I would encourage us to rethink our strategy on older adults experiencing homelessness, as I have a feeling these are folks who have been in the woodwork who are now coming out and have no other options. So I'd like, to, instead of us looking at this and going, hmm, increasing, 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 to start really looking at what other options we might have to address that and asking some of our partners to make a more concerted effort to do that. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Queen? Go for it. Natalie? Uh, Sean, thank you very much for that comment. I, I was wondering, as it relates to seniors, but also as it relates to newly homeless, have we looked at the eviction rate side by side to see if there's um, synergy there and are, are they the same? Just to show the trends are. That I'm would maybe curious. be a question, Katie, to see if that's something we've covered. <laughs> I think the challenge that we had is uh, our numbers have increased even throughout the eviction moratorium. So we're seeing evictions back to pre-2008 levels. Um, the pro-con of looking at evictions right now is we had a great law getting past the sealed eviction record. So we're still at kind of a little bit of an unknown when it comes to eviction filing. So now about 40% of evictions do get sealed. So um, filings are at a higher than, higher than 2008 level. Um, but the, if Taylor, if you scroll back up to that new on the bottom of page one, <clears throat> This graph, a little bit further up, that orange one, this has stayed relatively stagnant and actually our eviction records are going up right now and not coming down. So we're seeing a little bit of a disconnect. We do know anecdotally that um, we tend to see evictions happen and then maybe later people come into homelessness. It's not an immediate thing, but really looking at 
what is that correlation? And anecdotally, we can say that a lot of folks that apply for eviction assistance don't necessarily make it into the homeless response system. So I think there is a lot of unknown, and this is why we're working with further data to say, how can we match data on a longer term project? Um, but we would expect that trend to go even further dramatically up, and yet we're seeing a decrease. Um, I was going to echo what Sean mentioned also. At US Vets, we see a significant increase in veterans coming into our program, and we just have a, a struggle um, trying to find somewhere to place them um, for several different reasons. Um, so that is something too I'm very passionate about trying to find um, additional resources or solutions um, to house those individuals. Um, but I was also wondering if there's any data on um, like point of entry, like areas where that are the most populated, I guess, for individuals coming into the homeless um, um, system. Uh I'll probably have Katie follow up this response, but um, the level of data we have on that is really in terms of like where our outreach teams are. And so sometimes that data is just as robust as how many outreach teams are out there talking to people um, and how often they're talking to those individuals to actually get them um, in HMIS and get that information recorded. Um, and then I'm not sure if we have any recent numbers on like access points compared to outreach teams like where they're like are you wondering where like they're entering physical locations or just like getting captured in a report like this okay so then yeah I would say um I don't like those numbers divided by region I don't know how robust that is um we can definitely pull data for you I think uh we need some more follow-up information as to what you're truly looking for like are you looking for people touching outreach teams versus an access point versus a shelter or kind of what is that breakdown that you're looking for? Cause that all of those folks that I just mentioned are gonna be captured in this report. So you're looking at like what percentage is entering a shelter versus an outreach team. Okay, we're happy to pull that. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. With none, then could I have a motion to approve the homeless trends report? Motion to approve. John first, thank you. And I have a second. I second. Rachel, second. Great, thank you. Those in favor, please say yay. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Great, the motion, the motion passes. Thank you. We're gonna move on to our next agenda item. Dylan. Dylan Belmont, Human Services Planner with MAG, will provide an overview of the performance standards criteria that has been discussed in the committees and ask for feedback from the board. Thank you, Co-Chair. Um, yeah, so brief introduction. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, we are in the development of some performance standards, um, which kind of aim to uh, further break down those system performance measures we saw um, in the previous report provided by Clio, um, you know, those numbers are um, pretty broad and this gives us the opportunity to uh, dive in a little deeper and, um, you know, see how all of these different data points that are collected in HMIS um, really go through like the entire system, um, right? So if, Taylor, could you scroll down to the second page? Um, these are like the criteria that would be um, collected, um, but the full document would look something like this, right? So you have all of the criteria and then um, broken down by different um, like project type. Um, it'll show you the average of, um, you know, the system. So that way, like individual um, individual providers will be able to pull their own numbers and say, all right, well, we're performing at, you know, X number, X number of days for median length of stay and compared to the system as a whole, um, that's a little bit longer. So, you know, that could indicate that that's an area of improvement perhaps. Um, so we don't have the metrics yet. Um, that'll come at a later date, 
Um, so right now we're really just focused on um, making sure that the criteria included in the performance standards um, really represents, uh, you know, what the community is prioritizing, um, what's deemed uh, very beneficial. Um, so I think I will leave it at that. Um, we are looking for, for any feedback. So um, if anything seems off or needs further clarification, please let me know. Um, and then, like I said, full report with metrics included um, are to come. Great, thank you, Dylan. Are there any questions, comments, or feedback from the board? Dylan, across the top, when your SO, I guess, is what, street outreach, mm -hmm. and then you have emergency shelter, I think overflow, traditional, and enhanced. What are those definitions in general? Just give me some examples of what each of those categories would be. Yeah, for sure. Um, that is a great question. Thank you, Natalie. Um, as we know, like emergency shelter can come in a lot of forms. Um, so we felt like it wouldn't be entirely fair to, or maybe entirely productive to just group them all into one category. Um, so, you know, for example, um, like emergency shelters that are defined in this like bridge category, um, maybe have some more um, supports, right? It, it has like housing next step, whereas um, something like overflow would have uh, much less of that on the opposite end of the spectrum where it's, um, you know, could be um, beds in, in a parking lot or, or these like more temporary institutions. So, um, you know, that's, that's something that I think as we start rolling this out and, and seeing how, um, like shelters themselves want to define themselves or, um, you know, if there are any specific like outliers, um, these things can be adjusted, um, but hopefully starting out will give us a good idea of, you know, where those programs will fall. Great, thank you, appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? Great. Uh, as a reminder, as Dylan said, the performance standards with values will be back uh, for approval in March. And uh, with that, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. And so we're just going to keep it with Dylan today. Uh, you can give us an overview of the learning management system and next steps. For sure. Thank you, co-chair. Um, I am so, so, so incredibly excited to bring this to you all. Um, not that data isn't super fun, um, but I don't know, maybe this is just a little bit more exciting. Um, as many of you may know, the, the continuum of care, one of its roles is to um, provide training and, and technical assistance to uh, the community stakeholders, um, local governments, uh, a whole bunch of partners that, that make up the COC. Um, and for a long time, our, our methods, um, you know, we've had in-person training, virtual trainings, um, but in terms of archiving this content, making it truly accessible and available, um, you know, there, there's been plenty of room for, for improvement, right? Like we want a standardized um, system where, where everyone knows where to go to find this information. Um, and so the, the proposal in the works right now is, um, you know, partnering with a uh, software for a learning management system um, where, you know, we'll sort of be able to have this, this centralized location. Um, the, the, the main benefit, I would suppose, is, is um, you know, anyone in the community looking to find information uh, would have this source. Um, we have trainings that, that we currently partner with, with agencies on to develop um, on topics like, you know, our COC policies and procedures, um, or, you know, uh, what, what do frontline staff need, right? Do we need to learn about um, administering VI spadats or, or diversion? Um, so there is, you know, a, a ton of opportunity for, for making this um, really fleshed out. Um, and we'll definitely have more information to share at the next um, board meeting, but just wanted to um, put this out there to see if anyone has, you know, any specific ideas they want to see implemented or just any further discussion um, to take this further. Katie, did I hit every point? Am I missing anything? I don't think so. I, uh, the other element of the learning management system that I think is going to be really critical is that we are not going to be able, I think we've brainstormed over 200 trainings in partnership with the other two COCs. There's no way there will be 200 trainings available in the next three months, um, but really kind of getting to that robust process. Um, 
city of Tucson and TPCH already has a variety of trainings that are available that will be immediately adopted into our learning management system, but then continuing to build that kind of portfolio of trainings over time. Um, and then working with the other two COCs to figure out what are highest priority trainings versus lower priority trainings to be able to get folks up to speed. Great, any questions or comments? <laughs> you said dad is not sexy, but fun to Well, I know, I know personally I'm a visual, so it would be excited to see. It's always great to be able to share uh, information across from other COCs. So to be able to incorporate that would be great. So thank you for the update. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to the next item. Sorry, Dylan, you're not up for this one. Great. Katie's going to provide news. an overview of the project plan for the annual gaps analysis based on discussion from the strategic planning sessions. Katie? Thank you, Co-Chair Podlogger. Uh, Taylor, if you could scroll down, we're going to just jump straight into the action steps. So um, this has been a series of conversations with you all at your strategic planning as to what you want. This is required annually um, as part of the continual care to do an annual gaps analysis. And so just want to walk you through a project plan for kind of next steps. Um, so step one being identifying the current state of the homeless response system. This is really going to be analyzing a lot of the data that uh, Cleo just presented to you all, really getting a handle on inflow, outflow, how many people are active within the system. Um, then next step, reviewing our local strategy inventory. This is really building off of our past annual gaps analysis uh, that we did in 2021 and our SWOT analysis that was done in 2018 to figure out what gaps have we overcome and what have we not overcome and still have gaps in our system. And then holding a series of input sessions and listening sessions. And this is really where we're looking for feedback from you all as to how many of these different sessions you would like to hold, um, not only from community members, hearing from them what is missing and what are gaps in their community. I really see this being our favorite sticky note activity that I've put you all through a bajillion times. Um, and then also with people experiencing homelessness to really understand and get feedback on what they identify as gaps within the system. From there, we're going to synthesize all of that data, provide a written summary to you all, as well as uh, bring that through all of the different committees um, and really understanding the quantitative gap um, compared to availability and understanding what, where are there potential changes to happen? Where do we need to uh, identify resources differently? So um, really having this drive some of your NOFO decisions, things like that, and then um, really getting that final feedback from you all and um, implementation. So how can we start to address these gaps in the community? Uh, we can identify gaps all day, but if we're doing nothing about it, that's not as helpful. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, or comments from you all. Natalie. Thank you, Katie. Um, so given the conversation today about seeing more and more seniors going into homelessness, um, will that be automatically, I mean, given the conversation, will that automatically be included in the gap analysis for additional conversation? Okay, good, thank you. Mr. Chair and Katie, could you just give us some examples of how past gaps analysis have how those have influenced like the NOFO or, or some sort of like concrete example. So as a new board member, I can understand what we'll be looking at. Yeah. Um, so past gaps analysis have identified less NOFO for this example that I'm thinking of, but the quarterly trends report and the system flow dashboard really came out of the gaps analysis. We didn't understand the data as robustly as we needed to. It was not um, tangible and understandable to the general public. So that's where a lot of um, some of the system level things have or processes have come out of. Um, as far as NOFO specifically, um, last year there was conversation about uh, do we better identify seniors? Um, so that was like a conversation specifically among board members. Sean, I think maybe you're part, okay. Um, about should we be prioritizing like a seniors project? And ultimately the response was that yes, it is potentially a local priority, but in how do we weigh kind of both and. And so a lot of the conversation specifically about seniors is we need further investigation and understanding of this population and their needs because it's not going to be PSH in our community. And so um, Haley hosted a senior listening session to really understand those needs and how do we identify those. So I think um, I'm not coming up with a tangible example of how it would impact NOFO, but I think those are some of the examples that 
Yeah, no, that's great. I just want to know like, what will what what are some of the things we've done in the past once we got the results of that analysis. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Katie. Appreciate that. And with that, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Do board members have any action or discussion items for future meetings? Mr. Chair, uh, I don't know, speaking of NOFO, the supplemental NOFO, maybe you can get an update on when we might expect to hear. Uh, Chair Bob Logger, uh, Chris, we have not heard anything different. So as soon as you do, as we do here, we will send out an email out to board members as well as community members. Um, I think the, the last board meeting we were in, um, we had heard about round one and there's this infamous round two, but we don't know if that's actually a thing and we've not heard anything different. I actually got an email today that was announcing CDBG, ESG, like all of the city funding. And I like stopped our meeting, our internal meeting immediately and was like, COC money and we weren't included. So our guess is as good as yours at this point. Thank you. So it sounds like we'll hear in real time, whether it's at a meeting or in between. Great, perfect. Any other discussion items for, for future meetings? No, okay, great. Um, the next agenda item is comments from the board. Is there anyone on the board that has any other announcements or events that they would like to highlight? Okay. Hi, yes. I'm sorry, great, um, Danielle. I don't know if anybody is aware, but I heard on the news that um, Tempe is opening its Section 8 um, list. So um, I think it's important that if you work with homeless or, or survivors that we make them aware that that list is, is opening tomorrow. Um, that's all I could think of. Thank you. Great. Code Thank Chair you. Paul Blogger, can yes. I add um, the wait list is open until March 13th. Um, and if you're interested in applying or have clients applying, uh, they can go to the City of Tempe website, and it is also linked in our newsletter at the top under announcements. Actually, in response, it may have actually been item 10 instead, but there, with the change in VOCA funding, I think there's also a risk of people, because there may not be as much shelter for, yeah. for, for folks trying to escape, of an abuse situation may end up going to our homeless shelter, right? Like shelters, you know, emergency shelter, or find themselves out on the street or living in vehicles because they're trying to escape that. I think we need to be aware of that, especially as we go forward, um, as, as whatever that funding level looks like and what that impact is. So it may be something to consider for a future meeting or at least at the local jurisdiction or somewhere in this process um, to, to be taking a look at that. Okay. And then Great. I will just share that um, in, as far as DES, I am on a later in life abuse work group and DES is looking at 50 and older and not 62. So um, not wanting to bring a, a, a larger alarm, but um, that homeless group may be larger than what we're capturing at 62 and older. Okay. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Great, we'll move. What's that? I'm not looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, right? <laughs> right, thanks, Danielle. As we discussed during our board strategic planning sessions, we'll be having a series of COC office hours for members of the COC and the public to have discussion with the board. The first session will be Monday, March 20th from two to four. And if you haven't board already received the invitation, it will be sent out to you today. The session will be a hybrid with an encouragement to attend in person. Uh, we also have a registration link posted to the MAG website. And it will also be in the newsletter. There's a theme, the newsletter. We appreciate that. Any questions or comments? No? And as a reminder for everybody today, please sign in if you have not signed in as of yet. And with no further business, uh, the meeting is now adjourned.